it's spring of the year, late April. In a city that is known for its harsh winters, this is the time of year you long for, you hope for, you live for. Spring has finally come. Life is beginning to reveal itself. But you have no time for any of that. The city actually lies in ruins. It has been decimated by war. You are making your way through the city, picking your way among the debris, among the ruins. You have no time to look at the carcass of a once great city because you have a very specific mission in mind. You have a very clear focus. You have been given very specific directions, and you need to find the place to which you travel. You are on a mission from God. God has given you this mission, so you are taking it very seriously, even though you would rather do anything else but this. You finally come to the location. You descend to an underground bunker. You spend a few moments speaking with the guards who guard the bunker, and then they allow you entrance, and you are ushered into an underground room. There in the room, you find two people, a man and a woman. The woman appears to be 20, maybe 25 years younger than the man, but you have no time to linger over such realities. Instead, you walk up to the man, and you look him in the eye. You look into those harsh, angry eyes, and you say to him, I come with a message from God. The message that I bring you from God is turn or be overturned. The man growls out the words, God? What is God doing sending me a message? Why would he do that? And you say, I don't know why. He didn't tell me why. But knowing God as I do, I suspect it's because he loves you. It's those last four words that especially get to you. Because he loves you. You can hardly believe that you have spoken them, spoken them here, spoken them to him. You turn on your heel, rush up the stairs out of the bunker, and make your way through all the rubble, wanting to get as far away from that place and that man as you possibly can. You wonder, how could I have delivered a message like that to him? What would impel me to do that? But you know the answer. God sent you. And then your question is, why would God send me to speak to him? What kind of God do I serve? But then you wonder, will he heed the message? Will Adolf Hitler repent? Now, if you are like most human beings, even the consideration of such a scenario is profoundly distasteful. Your stomach turns at the prospect. Even if time could be turned back, even if God tapped you on the shoulder with a message, even if you live your life in a way so as to please God, the prospect of going to him with a message like that, especially because God loves him, turns your stomach. I can't do it, you say. I wouldn't do it. But somewhere right about there, you begin to understand Jonah, the ancient prophet, more fully. You begin to understand why Jonah fled. You begin to understand why when God said Nineveh, Jonah said Tarshish, please, as he bought his fare. You understand why when God sent him east, he went west. Because the reality was that the ancient Ninevites were the scourge of the world of their day. The terrorists of their day, they were the ones dreaded by so many others because of their warlike qualities. And Jonah is called to go. And so he flees. But now we rejoin Jonah this week. In fact, as we rejoin him, we rejoin him through a verse written by Lucy Shaw. My colleague, Pastor Marvin Ponder, shared this verse with me, a verse that Shaw wrote about both Jonah and the great fish taxi on which he traveled. Listen to how Shaw put it. 
Both were dwellers in deep places, one in the dark bowels of ships and great fish and wounded pride, the other in the silvery belly of the seas. Both heard God saying, Go. But the whale did as he was told. Well, Jonah is about to do as he's told. He's about to be obedient. But as I read his story, I think the kind of obedience he is about to manifest is the kind of obedience you might have seen this week when you grabbed your son by the hand, marched him into that room to face his younger sister, and you demanded of him, now apologize to her. And he stood there glaring at her, and he said, Sorry. (laughs) It's that kind of obedience. But that's what Jonah is about to do. So if you're up to the task, if you're up to following him in his distasteful obedience, take your Bibles, open them to Jonah chapter 3, page 1382. As we join Jonah, he is hundreds, hundreds of miles from the sands of the nearest Mediterranean beach. There is nothing but desert between him and that Mediterranean beach. So as we join him, he is sunburned. As we get near him, we can smell him. We smell the sweat and the sand and the sun. But there are also hints of sea. And to be real honest, it, honest, it all smells kind of fishy for some reason. But there he is, exhausted, obedient, irritated. And the story is told in Jonah, the third chapter. It says this, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, He relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. It strikes me that the story of this third chapter can be told by the actions of three participants. The first participant is Jonah. Jonah's discourse, turn or be overturned. Go back to Jonah 3, notice two verses, verses 3 and 4. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Three days. Most scholars think the writer is not talking so much about how long it would take to walk straight through the city, but rather how long it would take to go to all of the squares and the plazas and the buildings and the marketplaces where people would gather and deliver that message. Well, Jonah goes in, he gets one day in, and he begins to deliver his message. He preaches his message. It's a very short sermon. That's good. But it's a very grim sermon. Forty days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Eight words long in the English, five words long in the Hebrew. Just a brief, grim sermon. And it makes you wonder. It makes you wonder, did you come all this way just to preach that? 
All this distance, fleeing one direction, being brought unceremoniously back in the other, all this way just to preach that short, grim sermon. Is that really what you were supposed to preach? I mean, I've heard some grim sermons in my day. Who am I kidding? I've preached some grim sermons in my day. <laughs> and I'll have to tell you, the dictum is true. The only thing worse than listening to a bad sermon is preaching one. Well, here's Jonah, and he's doing it. Short, grim. It makes me wonder, did you get the message right? Did you hear clearly what you were supposed to preach? You want to make sure you got the message right. Last Sabbath, Anita and I weren't here with you. We were elsewhere celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary. 25 years, we got married at 10. <laughs> and so we were celebrating our anniversary. On the morning of the actual day, of our actual anniversary, we were texting each other, texting back and forth. Isn't that the way you do it these days, text? And so I was texting her, and I had texted her what I thought was really a, a beautiful message, one that I wanted her to have. Now, I have to say, I realized it again that day, sooner or later, autocorrect is going to be the death of me. <laughs> now, those of you who have smartphones know exactly what I'm referring to. For the uninitiated, let me tell you what it is. As you are typing away on that tiny little keyboard, it is easy to make mistakes. The smartphone recognizes those mistakes and corrects them. So it thinks. And you have to be very careful because it will correct it to something you never intended to say. Always read that message before you hit send because you don't know what autocorrect has decided you want to say. And so I texted that message, and I texted the last line, the beautiful line, I thought. Thank you, it said, for 25 years of companionship, growth, friendship, and love. That's what I intended to say. And then I looked at it, and it said, thank you for 25 years of companionship, growth, friendship, and lice. And I said, thank you, Jesus, that I hadn't hit send. Thank you so much for saving me. For sa Can you imagine? I got a beautiful text from my husband. Thank you for the love, the friendship, the lice. <laughs> You've got to make sure it's the message you intend. Is that really the message, Jonah? The message with which God sent you? I don't think you should have run if that was the message. After all, you think these people ought not be forgiven by God, and yet the message you stand up and preach is a message that says, 40 more days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. It's a message of judgment. What's the problem then, Jonah? Well, the problem may be that word, overthrown. Listen to the words of Old Testament scholar, Rosemary Nixon. Nixon writes, there are two things to note about the word overthrown. First, it is undeniably linked in the biblical tradition with the overthrow of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah where the same word is used. So when he uses that word, there are echoes of a previous time and previous action that he must have hoped would occur now. Nixon continues, however, and please hear this carefully, however, the word equally means a turning upside down, a reversal, a change, a deposing of royalty, or a change of heart. Thus, the message of Jonah could be understood as meaning, in 40 days, Nineveh will have a change of heart. As the Jewish expositor Rashi comments, the word overthrown has two senses, good and bad. If they do not repent, they will be destroyed. But if they repent, they shall indeed be overthrown, for they will have changed from evil 
to good. It was that double entendre that drove Jonah to Tarshish. I don't want to get there and preach a message that is a message of judgment or of repentance and salvation. I don't want to do that. But that was his message. Jonah's discourse was turn or be overturned. It was a warning of the impending doom that awaited the city. It's a warning that we look at and we ask, what does that have to do with us thousands of years later in sunny Southern California so far removed from the world of Jonah's day? Maybe it does have something to do with us. Maybe Jonah does still continue to preach that message of turn or be overturned because what in essence he is saying is repent or face the consequences of your action. He could be speaking to spouses, spouses who dissect each other with their words with their anger, with their fury. Maybe Jonah is saying, repent or you will be destroyed. But you say, those people were not just evil, they were violent. But isn't the world in which we live at times also violent? Statistics would suggest that in a group this size, in a congregation this size, there is a husband or two who has balled up his fist and struck his wife. And Jonah is saying, repent or face the consequences of destroying her, destroying your marriage. There's a wife in a congregation this size who with her words has been very destructive with her children, her husband, her family, who has destroyed them with her anger. And Jonah says, repent or you will face the consequences. There are parents who have spoken to their children in such violent words that their children may never fully recover. Words like, you're so stupid. Words like, I wish you had never been born. Words like, you are such a fool. Violent words to which Jonah says, repent or you will face the consequences. There are children who have stood on the playground laughing, pointing at the way he walks, at the way she dresses, never realizing that he and she go home weeping every single night. I can't face another day of their words and their looks. And Jonah stands before those other kids and says, Repent, or you will face the consequences. His message to ancient Nineveh is much like his message to us. Turn or be overturned. And so the story of chapter 3 can be told in the actions of three participants. First, Jonah. Jonah's discourse, turn or be overturned. The second is the Ninevites. The Ninevites' decision, we will turn and repent. Back to Jonah 3. Notice what it says beginning in verse 5. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them from the youngest, pardon me, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, cloth, and sat down in the dust. The Ninevites' decision, we will turn to God. Their repentance was profound and sincere. That first verse we read, three things happened. One, they believed God. God's Spirit somehow moved in and on them and transformed them. Secondly, they declared a fast. It was way, a way of crying out for the mercy of God. Thirdly, they put on sackcloth, which was a symbol of humiliation and repentance. Their repentance was profound. Now, what's quite stunning is that the repentance begins with the people. It's a grassroots repentance. 
It begins with the people, and it spreads like wildfire through the city until it finally affects the king, and the king himself steps down from the throne in repentance and then gives an order, says, let everyone, even the animals, repent. Scholars think he was covering his bases. We don't know exactly what all this God believes and doesn't believe, wants and doesn't want, so we're going to make sure that everyone repents, everyone wears sackcloth, and everyone, including the animals, stops eating. Now, I read just this last week that a small herd of 20 cows don't feed them for a day. Their lowing can be heard from a half a mile away. So can you imagine a whole city filled with animals that have not been given food, the cacophonous sound would have filled the sky and mixed itself with the repentant prayers of the Ninevites. This was a profound repentance. Such repentance is hard to come by, even in our individual lives. In fact, do you realize that the people of Israel who for decades, who for centuries had heard the messages of repentance preached by the prophets, in all of their history had but one repentance that would compare with this one. One, during the reforms of King Josiah, Maybe that underlines just how hard it is to come to that level of humbling oneself before God and others and saying, I repent, I am sorry. I read an excerpt from a book this past week. In fact, the excerpt I found so interesting that I immediately ordered the book. The book is titled, Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Me. The authors of the book talk about the penchant, the tendency we human ha humans have for self-justification. That we always want to justify ourselves. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't my problem. I read to you part of the excerpt I read. Self-justification, they write, allows people to convince themselves that what they did was the best thing they could have done. In fact, come to think of it, it was the right thing. For example... When researchers ask husbands and wives what percentage of the housework they do, the wives say, are you kidding? I do almost everything, at least 90%. And the husbands say, I do a lot, about 40%. Although the specific numbers differ from couple to couple. Are you listening to this? Although the specific numbers differ from couple to couple, the total always exceeds 100 by a significant margin. It's tempting to conclude that one spouse is lying, but it is more likely that each is remembering in a way that enhances his or her contribution. Over time, as the self-serving distortions of memory kick in, we come to believe our own lies little by little. We know we did something wrong, but we gradually begin to think that it wasn't our fault, and after all, the situation was complex. We start underestimating our own responsibility, whittling away at it until it is a mere shadow of its former hulking self. Self-justification. And yet when you read the repentance of the Ninevites, there is none of that. No excuses, no explanations, no blaming, Simply a falling low before God and saying, we repent. Please forgive. I wonder if that's the message of Jonah for us today. That call to turn or to be overturned that hopefully leads us to repentance. The kind of repentance that takes us to the people we have injured or damaged or harmed and says to them, I am sorry, I hurt you, I will not do that again. May I be so bold as to suggest that all the counseling, all the psychology, all the therapy in the world cannot replace the simple, humble act of repentance before God. Simply owning responsibility. Humbling oneself before God. 
and saying, I was wrong. I am sorry. And now that I have repented, I will take whatever steps to get help necessary to make sure that it does not continue to occur. The actions of three participants tell the tale of this chapter of Jonah's life. Jonah's discourse, turn or be overturned. The Ninevites' decision, we will turn to God. And finally, God's decree. God's decree. What is God's decree? Compassion. Compassion. Back to Jonah chapter 3 and verse 10. Here's what it says. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Make no mistake about it. God is after Jonah. He wants to broaden Jonah, deepen Jonah, expand Jonah's world. We'll see more of that in chapter 4. But right here, we come face to face with the intent of God's heart insofar as the Ninevites were concerned. We have the book of Jonah because God wanted to save the Ninevites. He wanted to reach out to an ancient people who were known to be cruel tyrants, violent and evil according to the book of Jonah. He wanted desperately to save those people. In fact, that's why he sent Jonah. That's why he went after Jonah. That's why he brought Jonah back. That's why he got him to the city. That's why he said to him, preach to these people because I desperately want to save them. I want you to think about what that means. Sometimes we miss the reality of the depth to which God's grace will go. We think of ourselves. We look around and say, well, we clean up well. We look nice. We're not that bad. We're pretty decent, decent people, fairly good. We have our struggles here and there, but nothing that profound. And so when God's grace comes to us and saves us, we are grateful for it. But we don't realize the magnitude of it until God reaches out to people whom we would throw in prison and throw away the key and says, See that person? I want to save him, her, for my kingdom. What does Jonah's story with the Ninevites tell us? It tells us nothing if it doesn't tell us this one thing. God desperately wants to save desperately lost people. He desperately wants to save people who are desperately lost. Why? Because of the grandeur of his grace and compassion, which so far outshines the horrible nature of of our sin. That's the reality of God's grace. So many who only play in the shallow tide pools at the edge of the ocean of sin say, well, God has taken care of me. He saved me, but never realize the depths to which God will go out in that deep, dark ocean to find someone else. Could it be? Could it be that God is after a Hitler, after an Idi Amin? Could it be that he's after a Saddam? Could it be that he is after the most desperately wicked people because he so desperately wants to save? It is his nature. If you find yourself pushing against that, I understand. And that's why I've come to understand Jonah so well. Jonah couldn't bear that thought. God, these people are desperately evil. How could you think of this? I want nothing to do with it. But the lesson Jonah is about to learn is that God desperately wants to save people who are desperately lost. Compassion. Two weeks ago today, I went into the new member dinner. New member dinner is a dinner we hold every quarter to welcome the new members of the Loma Linda University Church. 
While I was mingling with some of the new people, I met a new family. I met Eva George. Eva George and her family and friends were seated together, and as I fell into conversation with them, they said, we're from Nineveh. We are Assyrians. That's where we're from. Well, I was immediately drawn in to talk to that family and to talk to Eva, to hear what they had, to hear what she had to say. I was fascinated, so much so that I called back again this last week to talk, to hear, to understand some more. Here's what I found between what Eva told me and between my own searching. Here's what I discovered. We don't know how long the repentance of the ancient Ninevites lasted when Jonah came to them. We do know that they lived to be a problem to God's people again. But we also know something else. We know that somewhere around the first century after Christ, the message of Jesus came to the Assyrian people. And Eva said to me, when the message of Jesus came to the Assyrian people, they accepted it. They had been warlike people, gone to war and subjugated others, imprisoned them, tortured them. But when the message of Jesus came, they accepted that message and were transformed. And she said, today, it is unusual to meet an Assyrian who is not a Christian. A transformation. Maybe not just the message of Jonah continues to echo, but maybe it is the message of Jonah's God that continues to echo. A message that says, God desperately wants to save people who are desperately lost. I don't know how it is for you this morning. If you have only been in the tide pools of sin, this message might not be for you. But there are those here among us today who know what it is to descend into the darkness. Those among us here today, part of us who say, there are parts of me, of my life, of my heart, of my experience that I pray no one else ever knows. Because if they did, they would turn their back on me and walk away in horror. And so I remain hidden, closed off. If that is your experience, Jonah's message is for you. Because Jonah's message says God desperately wants to save people who are desperately lost. And he wants to do that because his compassionate grace so far surpasses our terrible sin. He wants to save you. He comes to you with a message that says, I will draw you into my grace. Whatever is the past, whatever has been so long hidden in your heart, can be forgiven, can be cleansed, and you can stand with the Syrian Christians who know what it means to have their lives transformed by the love of Jesus. That's his message. So if you came in to worship this morning, stooped low, soiled, stained, burdened, then hear clearly what the God of Jonah wants you to hear today. God desperately wants to save people who are desperately lost. Why? Because the magnificence of His grace so far surpasses our own terrible sin.